Yes. Okay. Right. Can you see so, the screen right now? Yeah, I can see it. And I can see the next one too. So that's great. Let, let me see how it goes. Can I sure. get started? Okay, sure. Great. So we are very happy to uh, have our very first speaker of the day, uh, Marco Sammartino from the University of Palermo in Italy. He's going to be telling us about MHD vorticity current system with L L1 data. Thanks, Marco. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the, for, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, so thank you for the presentation and thank you for the, Okay, for the for the nice invitation to this conference, I mean, to the organizers, I know it's must be quite a, an impressive task to organize an event with in this uh, you know live feature. Things are certainly more difficult. So thanks again. So uh, what I'm gonna talk today is about is MHD vorticity current system with a, a L1 data, and uh, we will our initial configuration is is R2, so it's a 2D problem. This is joint work with uh, Maria Schambeck uh, from University of California in Santa Cruz and uh, Vincenzo Schacca from the University of Palermo. Okay, let's see. So uh, MG, MHD equation are the magnetohydrodynamics equation and magnetohydrodynamics uh, is the study of interaction between a magnetic field and the, and the fluid which is moving and conducting. So let me just say a few words about what are the main application why MHID is considered as an interesting and important uh, field of applied uh, mathematics and physics, not only applied mathematics. Uh, well, the original application is plasma physics and plasma physics is uh, uh, quite relevant for, you know, for plasma, for the problem of plasma confinement and for the purpose of um, energy production. Uh, in which you try to reproduce thermonucle uh, thermonuclear uh, reactions. So tokamaks, stellarator, and spheromak are uh, under current uh, intense investigation. This is a field that maybe has been dormant for about 20 years uh, since uh, the 80s, and now is uh, really uh, resurrecting with its uh, great uh, strength. Uh, another important field of plasma physics is uh, of course, is astrophysics, um, in which, uh, well, stars, for example, are made of, of plasmas, but not only stars, they are uh, also the magnetospheres of some uh, many planets in which uh, the magnetic field is very strong. Uh, also, the stellar winds or interstellar medium are a, a field of application of plasma physics. Uh, and of course, uh, another uh, situation in which we have plasmas is the accretion disk of objects like black holes or uh, white dwarfs or uh, neutron stars. Recently, um, uh, magnetohydrodynamics has become also, uh, let's say it's a relevant for certain kind of uh, technology, like uh, technologies like uh, metallurgy, in which magnetic fields are routinely now used to heat, to levitate and control liquid metals. So, Okay, so these are, uh, are the uh, MHD equation I will, uh, um, usually when you, somebody writes the MHD equations in the, the community, that's our equation which, it, which is, or she refers to. And let me just uh, see how uh, you derive these, these equations. So uh, the Faraday law, it, it uh, let's say, the, so the starting point is the Maxwell equation. So the Faraday law, which uh, uh, links the time derivative of the magnetic field with the curl of the uh, electric field. And then the Ampere law, in which one neglects the so-called displacement current. So J is the current. And, uh, and the other uh, equation which is relevant is the Ohm law, in which the current is, um, proportional uh, through the conductivity constant to the to the uh, electric field and this equation is written in the um, 
the commoving frame, so where where the J is zero. And then it's, uh, let's say it's transferred back using the Lorentz transformation that you see uh, to, the, uh, to the right in the laboratory frame. So, uh, so this is quite relevant because it, that explains why one for in this one neglects the displacement current in the uh, the Maxwell law, which uh, you can see above, and the reason is this from from this equation, uh, given that this e plus u uh, cross b needs to be zero, that says that e is equal basically uh, almost equal to the velocity times b. So the displacement current, which is one over c squared, the time derivative of e, through a using this one and using some dimensional uh, analysis is v squared over c squared b over l. l. Well, l is the characteristic length of the system. And if uh, b of l is uh, basically is, deriv is a derivative of the magnetic field, so for example, a curve of the magnetic field, so neglecting the uh, displacement current with respect to the curl of b simply means that b over c squared is uh, very small. So basically, this means that we are uh, dealing with with velocity which are uh, much smaller with respect to the speed of light. So um, okay. So if one collects all, all these, uh, do does some kind of uh, some algebra, all these relationship, one derives that the time derivative of the of the, uh, of the magnetic field is equal to what you see here where mu is the uh, uh, um, ma magnetic permeability constant. Uh, and using some calculus uh, uh, identities and the incompressibility of the velocity field, one derives this, uh, the usual form of the, ma uh, the, ma uh, of the equation for the magnetic field. Concerning the, um, let's say the, the, the equation for the fluid, it's simply the usual uh, equation that one uh, has in the continuum uh, mechanics in which the uh, force is now the Lorentz force. So uh, when one neglects the contribution of the uh, contribution of the electric field and uh, you, you derive that this tau E, uh, where tau is the charge density, uh, is the neg negligible with respect to the current across uh, the magnetic field exactly with the same uh, dimensional analysis we used before. So once again, neglecting the contribution of the electric field with respect to the magnetic field is equivalent to suppo supposing that the velocities are much smaller than the velocity, the speed of light. So, okay, so and then, one, once again, uh, one uh, derives this uh, equation, which is at the bottom of the slide. Which I'm, so I'm re reproducing the, the equation here. Uh, okay, so if one pass to the dimensional variables and one introduces the Reynolds number. So we have a, the usual uh, Reynolds number, the, Reynolds, the fluid Reynolds number, and we have the magnetic uh, Reynolds number in which one compares uh, the, um, so Reynolds number, you compare the uh, inertial forces with respect to the viscous forces. So the, the, the magnetic Reynolds numbers, you, you, you compare the, the uh, advective uh, effects with respect to the diffusion of the, uh, of the magnetic, uh, magnetic field. So you, you see also the conductivity and the permeability of the magnetic field, which, uh, which are involved in the definition of the magnetic Reynolds number. And then there is this uh, a dimensional number S, which involves uh, the Artman number, which uh, for usual phenomena, it can be put, we could continue our analysis keeping this S, but we will put this number S equal to one. Okay, so these are the, the equation. Okay, so let me, I, I will not uh, make any attempt to, uh, to review uh, all the relevant results concerning the MHAD equation. So let, let me just mention the classical result of Duvo and Lyon and Saramange and Tamam in which uh, uh, they proved uh, 
going back to the 70s or early 80s, in which use, using uh, classical uh, analysis, they use uh, the global existence in 2D and the unique uh, and uniqueness and regular solution locally in time in 3D. Uh, for the, of course, for uh, divergence free initial data in L2. Then, uh, supposing the viscosity of the fluid greater than zero and the, uh, and the uh, permeability, magnetic permeability equal to zero, Pfefferman, McCormick, and Rodrigo and Romis in 2015 established the local existence solution for initial data in HS with S uh, large enough. So larger than N over two, well, N is the dim spatial dimension. And for uh, when supposing the viscosity and the uh, equals zero and instead the perme uh, magnetic permeability uh, greater than zero, Cosono, Prove global existence of weak solution in, in 3D uh, for divergence free initial data in L2. Okay. And there is a, a similar result in 3D uh, for Infor Fan and Ozawa in 2009. Okay. For the ideal uh, uh, case in which uh, both nu and mu are equal to zero, Schmidt and uh, Secchi. Prove uh, the lo local existence of strong solution when the initial data is in HS, when S is uh, quite large, it's larger than one plus and plus over two. While uh, Kaflish, Clapper, and Steele, they proved a condition um, for regularity, which is the equivalent of the very famous, quite famous Bill and Katomida criterion. So that Right now, so you have you so to have a blow up of the solution, you must have that the, the sum of the vorticity plus the uh, the current, so the curl of, of B, must accumulate sufficiently fast in at the at the, at the singularity time so that uh, this integral diverges. And finally, this this uh, let's say more recent and quite interesting result of Hamidin in 2014. In which he proved the existence of Udovich type uh, solutions for vortex patches uh, in 2D. Okay, so that's, that's the end of the review of, the, of some result. So, what I will do in the next couple of slides, I will write the MH, MHD equations. In, in the first, I will pass to the vorticity current formulation. So, the whole Basically, the whole talk is about uh, vorticity current formulation. So instead of using velocity and the velocity and the magnetic field, uh, I will use the vorticity and the current. And then I will put the equation in the in the mild form. Basically, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. So first, we introduce the vorticity and the and the and the current, taking the curl of the defined as the curl of the velocity and the curl of the magnetic field, then applying the, uh, the curl operator to the MHT equations, one obtains these uh, uh, MHT equations in the vorticity current formulation. So clearly the first equation is very familiar. So you, you have the usual, uh, we are in 2D. So we have this U dot uh, grad omega, now it appears, given the, the effect of the magnetic field, it appears this B dot grad the current. The current. And then there is this uh, dissipation term. The, the equation for the, for the current is, uh, is, let's say, quite symmetric, symmetric. So now there is a cross effect in which you, you have the U, U dot grad the current and vice versa. And you have the dissipation effect and now it appears this weird term uh, in which uh, you have this, uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if there's a, some kind of geometric meaning, but that's, that's what it is. It appears this, this, this term, which you, with respect to X of the magnetic field cross the gradient of the second velocity of component and the symmetric and the, some kind of and the, the analogous term. 
So now, given the relationship that omega is equal to the curl of u and j is the curl of b, then u in the, in the above equation, u and b are determined by the Biot-Savart law. So uh, u is uh, the convolution of k times omega, and the same for b is the convolution of k times j, where uh, k is the uh, usual Biot-Savart curl. So I, I'm just uh, rewriting uh, these equations, just uh, using incompressibility, and uh, so that now uh, and instead of you writing instead of u uh, the k convolution of omega. So I just put the u inside the, uh, the gradient operator, and the same for for b, and I one it can be, uh, I would say. I don't know if it is useful, but the, the, the funny term, the, this Q, can be written in, in terms of the Ritz operator uh, in, in this form. And uh, difficult to, to give an interpretation, but certainly from, from this one, it's, uh, it's apparent, apparent that this is a, an order zero uh, operator in, in the sense that uh, these op this are the, in the sense of the harmonic analysis. Okay, so now uh, we want to use, put this equation in the mild form. And uh, we have to invert the, the heat operator as it is uh, quite common. So we introduce the heat semigroup as the exponential of the uh, Laplacian times T and the lambda will be either the viscosity or the uh, magnetic uh, permeability. And uh, Okay, so as you know, given that we are in R2, this is equivalent to the convolution with a, with a Gaussian. And this, uh, uh, so we, if we give it integrating, uh, if we make a, a, conv uh, a convolution in time of this, of this semi-group, uh, we have a, the solution of, of, the, of the heat equation with source G. Analogously, we can introduce the capital G in which uh, we uh, have the gradient of U, which is useful given that uh, in our, in the previous equation, you see as a source, that the nullier term involves the gradient. Okay, so just inverting the, the, heat, the, the, um, the, heat, the heat operator, which appears in the equation, we write, we write the MHD equation in the mild form. So in which we have, this uh, u times the initial data, and the g appears because uh, we have uh, put the gradient uh, in the inside the operator of g. Okay. So we so the, the goal of the of the of the talk is to prove uh, global existence, the uniqueness uh, of the above equation, supposing that the initial data in the initial data. Um, in terms of the vorticity and current that are initial data in L1. So we are assuming that the initial data, that the initial vorticity and the initial current are L1. So the, the strategy is to first, let's say, justify uh, to prove local uniqueness, then local existence. Then we will see uh, that the solution that we, are cons we have constructed, even if they start with the L1 data, they are, uh, regular, which is not surprising given that uh, we have the heat, the dissipation. And then we will give a global bound on the L1 and L2 norm of, of the solution. Uh, and okay, and then from this one, we will, it will follow so rather easily the global axis and the uniqueness of the solution. Great. So let me, uh, Introduce the uh, functional setting. I don't see my own slide. Okay, I guess this is the mathematical setting. So in this problem, is, you, uh, it is uh, useful to introduce the cathode spaces, which are denoted by k alpha zero p l p, or more uh, concisely, it's k p alpha, when alpha is uh, greater than zero. 
So basically, a, a function which depends on time and on space belongs to this space if it is LP for each t, but it is weighted with a t to the, t to the alpha. And uh, the reason why Kato introduced this t to the alpha is clearly is to regularize the initial data. So maybe at the initial time, which is our case, the initial time our data are L1, but we want to deal with LP. Uh, we will, we will useful, it will be useful to, to study the solution in LP spaces with P greater than one. And then we have to regularize the, the initial uh, transient with this T to the alpha. This K dot alpha, Okay, dot uh, p alpha, sorry, is a are the function which belongs to kp alpha. So it's a, it's a, a subspace, but which at the initial time have more some some more regularity in the sense that if we take the limb soup of what is written above, above we have it's enough that it, were, it is bounded. Here, uh, be, beside being always bounded, it's it is required that we, if we take the limb soup for t going to zero, then this seminar is equal to zero. So it, it, at the initial time, it is slightly more regular. And uh, okay, so this is the functional setting and uh, we will heavily in the whole uh, procedure will be heavily use this LR LQ estimate of the heat flux in the sense that this, uh, operator so you, this g alpha at a gradient and while you you, you uh, sorry g lambda while u lambda didn't have a gradient these are bounded operators from lr to uh, k dot q alpha given that um, let's say alpha is one over r minus one over q so this means that uh, so this should be uh, Okay, so what does that mean? Is that, that if you um, regularize, initial, give, regularize with this alpha, then this, um, um, this Q can be large, larger than the, the initial datum. So that's what it means. And instead, uh, if you, instead we are, we are talking about the operator with the gradient, you, you need a larger regularization. So, Instead of having alpha, you need to have alpha plus one half. So the gradient basically gives you a more singular behavior of like one over square root of two, of, of t, sorry. So that's the meaning of this LRLQ estimate, which is uh, rather well known. Okay, let's see. Okay, so let me just give a flavor of the computation that, uh, um, Suppose that I, this is the, the only time, the only point of the talk in which I will show this kind of computation. Uh, so suppose you, you want to, to show your uniqueness, uh, which is actually was the, the, our first point, uh, our first item in our agenda. So you want to show unique, so you suppose you have two solutions you take, you could define the difference and then uh, you, there are solutions. So you subtract the equation and then you derive this, this uh, the equation for the difference, which is above. And then uh, let me just show how one can give an estimate of this G nu, this, the first term. So this G nu omega prime uh, K, K is the bios kernel convoluted with omega one, uh, estimated in the Cato space with a Q using the LRLQ estimate is, uh, so you, you get rid of this G nu, just passing to LR, and then the, 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 sec, the regularizing exponent of the time is two minus two over Q, given, because we have chosen one of R to be two over Q minus uh, one half, which is, but then we'll see why we want to appear this two minus two over Q because now we want to split using the um, uh, Young inequality. And then the, this two minus two over Q, the regularizing time, we split between these two terms. So that this two minus two over Q is become one minus one over Q at the first term and the same the second term. While P and Q 
are just uh, linked through the usual form of, uh, that appears in the young inequality. Okay. And then uh, we use the regularizing property of the of the Bio -Savar, Savar law to to get some more regular this one one and a half regularity in, the, in this term here in this so p has been substituted by by s where s is more regular than p meaning that it, it is uh, well more regular it means it is larger so we use uh, the regularizing property of the k to estimate the omega one in a uh, stronger space and then given the choice we have made gives you gives you that it's equal to one over q so in the at the end we are back to this to, from to the space q1 minus one over q and so we can collect uh, all the estimates saying that the the differences are less or equal than the differences as long as uh, the initial uh, as long as the solution is small sufficiently small and the sufficiently small means that this constant multiplied by this constant has to be less than one. This constant can be computed quite explicitly. Okay. So the, the corollary of, of this of, of, of this is that if the initial data in L1, that is a unique uh, solution. So let me just state, so, so this is the kind of computation, uh, okay, they're, they're quite technical, but uh, these are the kind of computation one needs to do uh, in this for, to bound these terms. So the theorem, which states the local existence of uniqueness of the, of the, of our, uh, of the solution, is that suppose that the initial data are in L1, then there, there exists a time t, such that the MHD equation in a mild formulation admit a solution uh, which the, belongs to any k dot q one over one, one minus one over q as long as q is belongs to one to infinity. It's unique, and uh, it is also uh, there is a time regularity in L one, so it's a bounded continuous from zero t in L one. So to I gave you a flavor of the kind of computations, so I will be quite uh, sketchy in the in how to prove. So the, the main tool to prove the above theorem is a fixed point uh, theorem. So we, we de define this ERQ, uh, comma Q, which is a ball in the cattle space. And it is uh, those, uh, so omega J, they, they need to be, less than r over q where r over q has a, this complicated expression in which uh, it appears uh, the d over q so just believe me just d, d over q which is as an explicit expression in terms of constants that derives from the estimates of the heat uh, operators so these are the i mean the, the, these are uh, these are numbers which are in in the books and well this row bar needs to be one over four over the q so that this rq is is a is a is a, is a real number so later so or even now we can we shall fix rho bar to be the norm in uh, the cattle space of the heat semi flow generated by the initial data so that this condition this smallness condition that rho bar needs to be one over four dq Will correspond to a small time existence condition. So, uh, sorry for uh, maybe it's confused, but the, the meaning of this slide is simply is that the, the, we will be able to rephrase the smallness condition of the initial data. We will be able to rephrase it in terms of the smallness of, of the existence of time, the time existence. Okay. Okay, so this we prove the strategy is to, uh, to prove this proposition. So uniqueness and local existence in this uh, ball, when Q is from is larger than four third and less than two, and uh, so suppose that Q, this again is a technical condition, uh, then there exists time 
a small time t sufficiently small time to q such that the mhd equation in the mild form have a unique solution in this uh, this ball of, uh, uh, of in the cut of spaces so the strategy is the same so this phi where phi is the expresses the uh, mild form of the, uh, of the mhd equation so uh, the the map sends RQ in, a, uh, in inside RQ, then the phi is a con is a contraction. I will not show uh, the explicitly the proof, but basically it's based on the computations that I, I showed you before. So once you you prove that, uh, and then you have a, a, a solution, then you can use a bootstrap argument to see that actually this. The solution omega, let's call it omega q j q that uh, belongs to the cut of space k q comma one minus minus one over q when q is between four third and two actually belongs also to the to the cut of spaces with where q prime is now from one to infinity. So once you prove to the, that kind of indices, you can plug the equation the the solution into the equation and in, get improved regularity so that you get the full range from one to infinity. And the, uh, the important byproduct of the uh, of the of the of these propositions that give you the local uh, existence and uniqueness is that you can compute the time of existence in, uh, uh, in terms of the size of the norm of the initial uh, data in L for third. So it details that this uh, expression, it, it appears to the fourth power and the, this complicated CQ, which is a complicated constant, but the time of existence can be, uh, is not uh, goes like, sorry, it's not last, but goes like this, uh, this expression here. So why it's important that if one has a global bound on this uh, L for third norm, morally speaking, once arrived at time t, the, a small time, then one can start again the same procedure from t, let's say, to from to t, and and so on. So the uh, the goal of the rest of the of the talk. How, how much time do you have? Uh, Eighteen minutes, something like that, I guess. Sorry, yeah, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, great. Uh, is to derive um, a global bound on, on this norm. For, for the Navier-Stokes equation, one has uh, the fact that L1 norm does not increase, and then Cato used that to, to get the global solution, but we don't have that for the MHD equations. So it's I need uh, 10 more slides to, to prove that. So the, fir the first step is the regularity of the solution after the initial transient. So, which is not, as I said, is not surprising in the sense that uh, we, one has to use the fact that uh, the mild form of the equation uh, gives you, is, is given in terms of convolution with the, uh, with the heat kernel. So one can prove that the time derivative of the vorticity and the time derivative of the, of the, of the uh, velocity of the current, sorry, the magnetic current stays in the KQ alpha. Simply one has to add some, where alpha of course is not just one minus one over Q, but as to one has to add this K over two, meaning that each time you take the derivative, you need to re give more regularization of the initial transient because you start from a, from a data which is L1. So you, you need to regularize. If you take more, the more derivative you take, I mean, after the initial transient, which is regularized by the stronger alpha, then the, the datum is regular. And the same, of course, for the uh, velocity and the magnetic field, where alpha now, instead of having one here, we have one over two, sorry, it's two over, it's missing because we can, we, we need a slightly less regularization because the velocity is more regular than the vorticity and the magnetic field is more regular than the current. Okay, so that's something which is not surprising. So how to prove the global existence? So the roadmap 
is the following. First, we will derive, we want us to derive an, an a priori integrated in time L2 estimate on the gradients of the velocity uh, and of the magnetic field, which this will require, of course, to pass. First, we will pass back again to the velocity formulation and we shall use a radial energy decomposition because the, the U, the, the velocity and the magnetic field are not L2. So we need to use a radial energy uh, decomposition. Then we will derive an a priori L1 estimate on the vorticity current. And then we will derive an a priori L2 estimate on the vorticity current again. And by interpolation, we shall get an, a bound, a global bound L4 third, which already uh, mentioned that it is very close to getting global existence. Okay, so what, what is uh, rad radial uh, uh, energy radial decomposition? So if we have a, a smooth incompressible vector field omega x, it has a we define it to be to have a radial and ener radial energy decomposition uh, if uh, it exists a smooth, a smooth radially symmetric vorticity omega. Radial mean depends on, on on the modulus of x such that the velocity v can be, can be decomposed in the radial part, which the uh, omega bar, which derives through the Biot-Savart law from the vorticity, from the radial vorticity, plus a part v which has bounded L2 naught, which is so. But what, that's why energy radial. So this is v as from v we can define an energy because it's there's an, an L2 uh, bounded norm and plus a radial part. And the theorem, which is, whose proof can be uh, seen in the Maida and Bertozzi uh, book, and is smooth incompressible vector field omega such that uh, its vorticity is L1 as a radial energy decomposition, radial energy decomposition. So that's exactly what we need, what we have, or what we need. So we write in a, a radial energy decomposition for U and B. Uh, where v uh, so u is equal to v and plus u bar and b is equal to small v plus b bar where v and b uh, and small v have uh, are diver divergence free and with finite l2 a norm while u bar and b bar have uh, are defined in terms of the Biot-Savart law from the uh, from the radial uh, vorticity so. Clearly, uh, what we do the following. First, we write the equation. We, ask, we impose uh, the, the equation for the uh, radial part of the vorticity. And it is natural to impose that the radial part of the vorticity obeys the, uh, the heat equation because the convective term uh, cancels. Because if the vorticity is radial, then its gradient is, the, is a vector which is perpendicular, let's say, to a circle around the center. While a vorticity which is derived from a radial uh, vorticity is tangent uh, to the circle. So, it, so V dot grad omega is the, is the scalar product of two, per, of two orthogonal vectors. So it is natural to assume that the radial part of the vorticity obeys the heat equation and the same for the magnetic current. So the radial part is easily written in terms of the initial data and then all the needed regularity properties because they solve the heat equation. So once you construct the radial part, then you can easily write the L2 part. So which is uh, you plug it into the equation that now they become more complicated, but it's uh, rather easy to give energy estimates on this uh, L2 part. And you see there is no, uh, okay, this is the equation for the L2 part. Okay, so for example, uh, one immediately derives that uh, the maximum in time of the L2 uh, norm uh, is bounded in terms of the initial data, and okay, this is a constant, and you, you see that I, we wrote, I wrote the explicitly the constant 
of course, it seems complicated, but I think anyone recognizes this that derived from some kind of Gronwell lemma. And uh, one can derive also the integrated in time, uh, a control of the integrated in time gradients uh, because there is dissipation. And this control is uh, not only on, on the, on the, on the on the energy part, but on the on the U and capital B, so on the whole velocity and the whole uh, magnetic field. And again, this C2 as a, an explicit expression in terms of the initial data. Okay. Okay, so now we have the integrated in time control of the gradients. Uh, we can, uh, so now we want to derive the NL1 norm and to do that, so we write the system, we linearize in the sense that we say the system system in, in the sense that U bar and B bar, we can now consider as non-regular functions. So we, we already have the solution because we have the, uh, we constructed the solution before, but uh, now we interpret that as a quasi-linear parabolic uh, system. And then uh, for this kind of uh, quasi-linear parabolic system, you have the solution, the L1 norm of the solution is bounded in terms of the initial data plus the integrated in time gradient of the coefficients, okay? But the coefficients are what we already, we have already constructed, they were what we were already shown to be bounded. So we have uh, a bound on the, the L1 bound on the vertices and J, as long as the solution exists, of course. Okay. Uh, the, the, the above theorem is just a consequence of the fact that you can write uh, the existence of Green's function. It's that's, you can find that in the book of Abner, for example. Okay. So once we have the L1 bound, then we can go back again to the energy radial decomposition and uh, uh, we already have the equation and then okay, we already show that. So this is just a, a recap of what we've done. And then, then we want to get a, improve this bound then get a bound on the, on the, on the, um, on the vorticity. So, which means that we, we get a bound on the gradient of the, uh, of the, not integrated in time, but just uh, without the, the regularization of the integration. And we just write the equation and we multiply by the Laplacian of V and we do the usual uh, classical computation. And we finally derive a global bound on the gradient of the velocity and of the, magne of the magnetic field, which in terms imply a global bound on the vorticity and on the current. So I think I have five more minutes, but should be enough. I have five slides left. Uh, so, so interpolating between L2 and L1, we have a, a bound on the uh, fourth third norm of the vorticity and the current. And the global bound depends on the, on the initial data and of course on, the, on new and, and new. So let me recap. So we have constructed the, the cathode solution in zero time t with a short time existence. This solution, besides an initial transient, is regular. Then we have gotten a global bound of the uh, gradients, a global bound on L1, and then a global uh, bound on the vorticity current. Then using interpolation inequality between L1 and L2, we get uh, uh, until the solution exists, we get a global bound on the L4 third norm of the vorticity and the current. Um, okay. okay. Sorry, we, I repeated that. And then uh, now uh, we, we want to use the estimated time of existence, which as I said, goes like the uh, one besides the fourth and the constant is one over the L4 third of the vorticity. 
So to, to get the global existence, now we use a classical argument. So once you arrive at a certain time T1, start again for a time T2 and so on. So if the uh, if these times for which we have the solution add up to until you get to, to infinity, okay, we are done. But suppose now that, that you stop uh, to some T, T max, which is less than infinity. So this means that this Ti needs to go to zero. And therefore, if this Ti goes to zero using this, uh, this bound above, that means that this omega, uh, the four third, norm, um, four third norms of the vorticity and the current needs to go to infinity. But this going to infinity contradicts the global bound we've given uh, before in terms of the initial data. So uh, the theorem, which is the final result of this uh, talk, is that the, uh, the unique solution omega and j of the MHD equation, the MHD equations with the initial data in L2, given by the local existence theorem, actually is global in time. And these solution are, are for t are smooth for t greater than zero. Uh, well, in particular, it belongs to L1 uh, intersection L infinity. Okay, so um, so for between uh, uh, open problems. Uh, so open problems, I would mention the the possibility that instead of having data in L one, you have uh, measures, with, for example, with atomic parts, so with deltas. So the procedure I showed you before. Uh, would can be repeated but only for existence of local uh local uh, existence and actually the data need to be small so you cannot rephrase the smallness hypothesis on the data in terms of small time uh existence the data needs to be small for navistocks gallagher gallet and uh, Lyons in 2005 proved also for uh data which are uh, deltas uh, which, uh, which are measures with atomic part. And the proof relies on the fact that uh, this of the exists of this special solution, which are the ozine vortex, uh, are the unique solution of the two dimensional Navier-Stokes equation with Dirac masses as initial vorticity, plus the fact that these ozine vortices are attractors uh, of any homogeneous solution with integrable initial vorticity. Uh, so one wonders if similar properties hold for the 2D MHD equations. Uh, of course, another problem would be the zero viscosity and uh, zero uh, permeability of these solutions. Uh, we have just preliminary result that uh, I don't have time to discuss them. So I think that I thank you and I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks, Marco, for this very interesting talk. Let's uh, thank him for, for this. And uh, I open to any questions that the audience may have. I see in the chat that Haruni uh, has a question. If you want, you can unmute yourself or you can also type in the chat. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor, for this very nice talk. Uh, I just have two questions. So this this concerns the maybe I I misunderstood some parts of your talk. So I just want to know so your, your initial data, your vorticity, and your current initial current are just L one. That, that that's it. Right. And I think at some point you used that like an energy uh, estimates for the velocity and the magnetic field, isn't it? Right, so you, you, you're right. So I missed, I missed to say the following. So uh, the, those global bounds, I guess I, I think if global bounds holds if the, um, the data are regular. So of course you proceed the following ways. First, you start your local existence theorem. You arrive to a certain time, let's call it T star. The solution after the initial transit is regular. So the, the time zero, which I'm, I'm referring to in the uh, at the in the last part of the talk, actually, can, is this T star? So you start uh, now a solution from a datum which is now regular. 
Okay, so of course the the norm can be uh, as grown as, as yes, become but, uh, bigger, regular. but then okay. then you you're starting from something which is regular, and then you can use the global bounds. Yes, but regular in the sense that all the vert uh, the vorticity and the uh, and the, the current fields are are in LP LP, LP uh, is in space. Sure, and you cannot get like uh, also the also the deri also the, sorry also the derivatives. Yes, but the derivatives the, will get, uh, oh, okay. Okay, but the, yeah. the, 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 this is still derivatives of derivatives, so you cannot get uh, an L2 bound of your velocity and magnetic field from uh, derivatives of the vorticity and the current, uh, if, I, if, I, well, uh, if I compute things well in my mind. So I, I, maybe if, for, if your vorticity, initial vorticity and initial current are just L1, I think you cannot get a, a bound of your initial. Uh, so I think uh, an assumption yeah, like- Yeah, yeah, you, uh, you, you are- uh, uh, yeah. But I, I think I think that I mean what what you do, you first uh, construct the solution for a certain for a small time, and then mm -hmm. at, up to t star, and then at t star half the solution is regular. Yes, uh, regular okay. in, in what sense? Uh, yeah, sorry for in the, in the sense that you can you have, it's a classical solution. It, it is a it has a derivative. And uh, the derivative is in in uh, is uh, in LP for any p. Okay, I'm still okay. Uh, uh, okay, maybe I'll try to to do it to do it explicitly and see. Um, so my, my second question. Okay, okay maybe, global... maybe you can you can look in the paper. Well, Cato did the same for the for the navier stokes equation. So. Yes, but uh, I think he was he was like trying to do uh, estimates on the vorticity, not on the on the velocity. If if, if I uh, no 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 no, he, he gave sure. a, a regularity also for the velocity. Okay, uh, I, I, will, I will check. After, this after all, I mean that there is a heat heat operator, so okay. Okay, so my, my second question is concerns the the global. If if I may ask a second question, of course. Mm -hmm. So it concerns the global estimates. No, ask, ask to the ask to the chair. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Gonna... Well, we have Helena who also raised her hand. Um, but yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, I guess we are entering the uh, coffee break time, but I guess it, we can it, continue. Just, it, it just concerns the global estimates for the, the LP, uh, your global estimates. It's a, it is just in terms of the LP norms for P in between one and two. So you don't have global estimates for uh, the, the rest of the uh, LP norms, or it's global, uh, or all the estimates you get at the end are global. Because the bootstrap argument, if I understand well, it it works locally well. So you have locally you have all the estimates in, in between uh -huh. L one and L infinity, okay? Right. So, but the, but the global bounds, it seems like you have just because you are, you are using energy inequality. For, mm -hmm. So uh, I think all the global it's it's my question. So all the global estimates are just for p in between one or two, or all all the LP estimates are global in time. Well, at the end. first first we do it from between four third and two. Then uh, yeah. and then that's where the the, the, the small ball need, needs to be. So it, it works only for 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 that one. Then that's the solution which lives in that small ball. Then you can prove that lives in a cato spaces in all cato spaces, and that's yes, that's yes. that's uh, something which is needed for uniqueness. Okay. Yes. So at the end, you have you have like global uh, bounds for, uh, in all your uh, yeah okay okay thank you very much that's what I want to know thank you thank you again for your nice talk oh, thank you Elena do you want to say something uh, hi, yes Elena. please hi hi Marco how are you I'm fine great good very nice talk good to see you too thank you very nice talk um, I was just wondering you you currently what you have is uh, existence with uh, in L one for vorticity and, and, um, and current. In L1, yes, for the initial right. datum, which is in L1, right. Yeah, so you mentioned, you mentioned in your conclusions, in the, the open problems, you mentioned the uniqueness for uh, direct masses, for del direct deltas. Right. But mm -hmm. you, you don't have existence in, in, that, in that setting. Um, uh, for, for, a small, yeah, for a small time, you, you have uh, existence. Ah, OK, OK. Uh, for small data. So okay. what? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. What I was wondering is if you looked at sort of an intermediate step a la Giga Miyakawa Osada. Mm -hmm. so, so where you take, where you can take uh, uh, measures with atomic parts, but with small atomic parts. 
but the mass is small. Well, that might in this case that might work, uh, but I don't I don't know. I have, but that's that's a good that's an interesting point. Okay. Maybe that's uh, right. Maybe it could could be done also. Okay. Yeah, we will. Okay. Uh, maybe it could be done on th that case, but you know, okay. that's a good Thank point. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, for now, that's the only question. For now. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for all the interesting questions. And with that, let's uh, thank Marco again for his very nice talk. Thank you. And I guess we are time for, it's time now for the coffee break. And uh, I guess as usual, maybe the link for Gather Town is on the chat. So feel free to link to uh, click on that. And we resume here in this Zoom uh, room in uh, 25 minutes. So, or 1120 Brazilian local time.